Well, I'm delighted to welcome back for, let's call it the second half, because we're talking about football here. Uh, Jonathan Harding, um, uh, absolutely first book that I, well, it may not be your first book, but it's the first book I read of yours, which was Mensch, which was an absolute beaut. Uh, really enjoyed it. Jonathan, really great to have you back. Great to be here. Thank you for those very kind words, Joe. Very kind. Thank you. <laughs> oh, it's the, it's the least I can do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, um, just uh, before we jump into the book, it might just be worthwhile just doing for those people who haven't necessarily gone back into the back catalogue. So I'm very nearly coming up to 200 episodes. I can't believe that, right? That's so off. anyway, Congrats. I know, yeah. <laughs> so um, coming back to um, uh, before we jump into the, into the, some of the context, really good, really good stuff in there. Might just be worth a quick a quick recap and maybe even a catch up since we last spoke, which I don't know, maybe a couple of years ago, maybe. So yeah, yeah, be good to good to catch up, really. Yeah, definitely. Well, it's been a while. I think off the back of Mensch, I, I found myself very overwhelmed by a lot of the response from coaches in the field. And it was really humbling to, to get that. I was really delighted. But I still had one question that I sort of really kept coming back to. And that's ultimately what led me to, to write Soul. Um, I think in those, in the time since we've spoken, you know, basically ended up coming to that idea quite quickly after Mensch, to be honest. Um, it's funny because the design of the book is quite similar to Mensch, the front cover and the three lines and all mm. of that. And, you know, my publishers already joked with me, like, got to complete the trilogy. <laughs> so, um, and I, I've said, you know, hold on. I just finished the second one. I need a break. So, um, yeah, I, I think that the thought I had at the end of Mensch was definitely just an extension uh, of, of the ideas that I was able to explore there. And that was essentially does sport care about people, human beings at you know, the top level? And I think that's what led me to write the second one. It's what led me to go and fortunately before the pandemic, you know, go and meet people and see how they were doing it and put together, you know, hopefully what I consider to be like a collection of the best voices in this field, you know, people who are actually making such a difference and um, hoping to basically spark a, a change you know lead to a conversation that, that leads to great change in this area and I know that you and many others feel the same way so it's very encouraging to to have the chance to talk about it awesome um and just going that kind of stage back even almost going back to sort of you know the origination of Mensch mm. um you know you, you're somebody who writes about football professionally you're a journalist and and then obviously through I guess being in that space then also then decided that, you know, for the first book, which was about, you know, essentially German coach education culture, pretty much. Um, mm. And then obviously from that, you know, there's, a, there's this one. But, you know, what first and foremost, just just getting into the idea of writing about particularly football, but also other forms of football, this, that and the other. I mean, how did you stumble into that? <laughs> I think when my career started, uh, I think I, I didn't really know what I was going to do. I think like a lot of young people, you know, mm. what are you supposed to do? You go to university and you study the subject that you're told that you're the best at. I think a lot of the time you are fumbling in the dark a bit. Right. And I yeah. think in my situation, I was fortunate that I had languages and I would say to anybody, if you can, if you're not sure what to do, study a language because it, it really does open up so many doors because then you give yourself the opportunity to do almost anything further down the road in a different place. And there's something quite exciting about that, but I certainly didn't know, what I wanted to do. Um, I always loved writing when I was younger. I loved sport. And when I realized that professional sport wasn't really a possibility, I wanted to stay close to it somehow. And uh, the two sort of perfectly intertwined. I mean, I've said many times, I owe Mario Goetze an awful lot. If, if he doesn't score the winning goal in the 2014 World Cup final, the interest isn't there in German football. And the luck that comes with the timing of things in life doesn't fall for me. Um, if it's Argentina, Argentinian football, Lionel Messi, the whole, you know, era and, and glory of that shifts to a different place in a different time. And German football becomes sort of this country of nearly men in the footballing world. So I, you know, I owe a lot to circumstance and just being in the right place at the right time. But um, yeah, when it, when it comes to getting into football writing, it took the long way around. You know, I started working in translation, working in media, um, indirectly did a lot of jobs on the side got fortunate enough to get opportunities took them made the most of them and it's a it takes a long time you know it takes a long time and I was lucky to get in at a time when it wasn't overflowing like I think it is now 
Um, so very fortunate to have timed it well, I guess you could say. Um, but I, I, you know, you spend a lot of time writing. I just wrote a lot because I feel that that's one of the best ways to get better at it. Uh, it intrigues me. The reason I ask the question is it intrigues me always to hear people's kind of circuitous stories to, to where they get <laughs> to because um, everyone, I think, you know, has, tends to think or they kind of buy into the notion that there's this sort of grand sort of linear plan. Yeah. And in fact, actually, for the for this conversation, that's what's sold often to a lot of kids that do this, do this, do this, do this. And the end product is some form of sporting immortality. But the reality is, is that actually very often, even for some great athletes, the route is far from linear. So it's an interesting, interesting journey. And, and also from my own perspective, you know, I've told the story many times that, you know, in my own career, I wanted to be a graphic designer and my art teacher caught me on the hockey pitch for the 15th time when I should have been in his class and said, maybe you should have a career in sport, um, which was also his kind of way of saying, um, I'm dropping you out of my subject. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but he, it was the best career advice I think I probably ever got, which was kind yeah. of interesting because it did change my, uh, my career journey. And interestingly enough, I've got a 14 year old boy at home who is currently just, just about to take his options. And actually one of the debates we're having is, so he's actually, he's somebody who's, he, he has sort of mild learning difficulties, uh, dyslexia, that sort of thing, um, albeit, you know, uh, it's not probably severe enough necessarily for him to be given particularly, you know, kind of special support necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, therefore, you know, he's just one of those people who just struggles with, struggles with um, words a little bit more than other people do, takes a bit longer. However, it appears from the results he gets that he's something of a linguist. Hmm. Now, I'm, I was very fortunate to grow up uh, living abroad for, while I was very young. When I was five, I grew up in West Africa in a French-speaking colony, Guinea, which is why AFCON is always fascinating for me. Hmm. Um, and, um, uh, and I so basically was pretty fluent in pretty much bilingual, so pretty fluent in French as well as, uh, as, well as English. Right. And then obvi obviously when I came home... Um, or, you know, a number of years later, and I started to do GCSE French, um, I kind of, words came out of me that I didn't even know I knew. <laughs> it's weird. But yeah. so, and so I've always, I, I like you, and then fortunate enough to studied Latin and a few others. And so I've always kind of liked language and found languages relatively, I'm not saying easy, but I can kind of get by in most countries based on, on that ability. Mm. And I'm trying to debate with him about whether to do languages, because he's quite good at them. He seems to get quite good results. But it's kind of a straightforward choice between does he do a language or does he do computer science mm. combined with something like iMedia? And you think about where we're going in the future. I'm, I'm asking you for career advice. I don't know why. But anyway, it's just an interesting discussion, isn't it? Because I, like you, I'm led towards languages, but I don't yeah. know whether to suggest that for him, knowing it's a, it's a more difficult thing, mm. knowing also that the likely areas that he's going to have in his career and the basis is things like digital media and all those sorts of things. I don't know. It's a really interesting discussion, isn't it? You can, yeah, it is. You, you could also make the case there that ultimately because of the way that technology has integrated itself into our day-to-day -day lives, he doesn't need an extra class on that because he's going to have grown up in a world in which he's probably pretty digital, digitally able and capable anyway. Digital I mean, native, you, yeah. Exactly. If you think about that, even if I think about my generation, uh, we we grew up before smartphones, and boy, am I grateful for that. Mm. But if I think about the generations that have followed me, there is no concept of a world without the smartest computer in the world, the size of it being the size of your palm. So, like mm. that in itself lends itself to a sort of a technological development that you're going to have, right, as mm. a young person. And so maybe there's there's a, a case to be made there that because that's happening anyway, whatever you pursue, yeah. um, you know, languages offer something else. I mean, ultimately, I'm sure he has to decide what he what he wants to do and what makes what makes what said, sense well, for him. On that subject, this this will intrigue you as well. He said something to me, um, which which actually sort of not. He said, "Well, languages are going to be obsolete. I've got translation devices." Mm. So that's, I, was, I was a bit like, ooh. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Some people have said that, but I, as someone who has experience with, with the translation devices and being the person who is effectively being replaced in those environments, I think, um, yes, technology will move us closer and closer towards 
being able to translate, you know, vast swathes of text quicker than a human could. But I also think that there's something to be said for understanding nonverbal communication or yeah. the subtle ways in which language differs that a computer could not. Yeah. And so really a lot of language these days, especially if you study the history and the film and the literature around a language, it's not just studying what word is different in each language. There's a lot more to it than that, obviously. You start to get an understanding of people that yeah. speak this language. And so I think when we say study a language, I think we should also be saying sort of studying a history, studying a culture, culture. Studying, studying a lot more than that. And that's something that I think, however advanced we we, we get in terms of technology and that kind of translation and, and adapting languages. That's something I think we absolutely need to retain as human beings because it's a bit like passing on stories over the years. Yeah. You know, storytelling and the art of storytelling is at the bedrock of, in my opinion, of human connection and how we feel good about the world and almost everything we do is comes back to stories. And the reason that that has survived is because we have written down stories or we have found a way for stories to survive over the years, whether that just be through really retelling them and retelling them and retelling them. And I think a, a large degree of understanding one another across languages is also to do with passing on that knowledge to the next generation, to the next person who might speak that language so that 50, 100 years from now, we can have an even better understanding of how to speak to someone who's from a different country who speaks a different language. And that's something I don't think you can ever replace with, with technology. Uh, you're you couldn't uh, you're totally right and the more i think about it the more i think um actually when if you talk about let's say the industry of coaching for example mm. or the industry of human development in any form regardless of whether it's sport necessarily or not yeah um we're, what we're talking about is our ability to communicate and so you know there is probably a very strong argument like you say to that actually the understanding of different cultural dimensions around communication and the stories that are told and all those sorts of things becomes a really powerful and useful mechanism to help you with communication i'm reflecting now um i guess you know i've often said to people i think that maybe maybe if if i have a talent maybe one of the talents is the ability to communicate verbally with people yeah. um, and and so i now think well actually maybe my kind of upbringing and then you know studying language how much of a role did that play hard to tell but I, it can't have been inconsequential in some respects no definitely not and you absolutely do have a talent for it. i mean everyone i've spoken to who's spoken to you have been on the podcast or has interacted with you has spoken of that ability that you have and i think certainly we perhaps as a society generally underestimate the ability to communicate clearly um to be able to hold conversation to understand the nuance in conversation how to communicate with different people at different times, when to say something, when not to say something, how to interact and move around certain people based on the way that they're communicating, all of the nonverbal communication that comes with that it is intense and it is a great skill. And I think a lot of that will certainly have originated in your case um, from your experience with another language at a young age and also just living in a different country from a very young age. I think that will have subconsciously, maybe also consciously, opened your eyes in a way that is not possible if you live in the same place for 20 years yeah yeah I, I did try on several occasions I very came very close actually taking roles in different parts of the world because I wanted to give my kids the opportunity to expose different cultures as well oh. I grew up in Papua New Guinea as well which was also an eye-opener anyway different story but on the subject of storytelling <laughs> which is a lovely segue um um well you know and you as a storyteller um so uh i've been as i uh, as i was saying i kind of i'm not very good at reading books in a linear way i tend to go <laughs> back and forward and what have you and jump in and out and yeah if you saw my desk now you'd see there's a lot of different books that i'm at various stages <laughs> of reading so um i have you know i've been been really getting getting into this because what i find is once i get into a chapter i have to finish that chapter so there's mm. definitely something about storytelling one of the things that's really interesting in this book as well, which I'd love to sort of get you to sort of expand on and, and talk a bit more about the journey of its creation, because clearly mm. you yeah. spent time immersing yourself in environments and absorbing much more than necessarily what people might tell you about what they do, but actually absorbing the reality of what they do and how that manifests and all those sorts of things. And what's really interesting is as you go through different countries and you're in different environments, what you're at, what's actually saying, you're actually sort of, I think, combining 
you're telling a story of that place through your eyes and the story of that place through the eyes of the people there it's a really interesting way of getting underneath a culture I think yeah I mean I always wanted to tell stories with with the help is maybe the wrong way of expressing it but I I wanted to have other people in these fields have the opportunity to tell their stories themselves I, I never wanted to be the person riding on in as you know this white knight savior figure telling all the stories that was never my intention um, and I'm glad that you feel that that's not how it came across because it was certainly designed to be a platform or a book or a collection of stories of voices from people who who had experienced and were doing this work themselves and I wanted to put that out to stand on its own of course I have feelings on, on it as, as I go through it and as I experience it and, and that is part of the story but the stories themselves are definitely from the people in those places and I think it was always valid to me or always really important that the, the places that I'd been to or the people I'd spoken to in these places, that the, the cultural context or just the general context of these places was always taken into consideration. I think when we talk about sport, when we talk about anything, it's very easy to make quick assessments without considering the context. You know, you can say almost anything that we do requires context. Yeah. And I think sometimes in sport, it's so easy to make an assessment of a coach or a player or of a situation and say, well, you know, they didn't win on Saturday, so they're not a good team. Or he only ran nine kilometers, so he probably hasn't got enough effort or determination in him. You know, sometimes these assessments are laid bare to us or, or displayed to us in a way that makes it easy for us to say, well, that's wrong or that's right or he's good or he's bad. And ultimately, there's so much more involved inside an individual, inside a team, inside a club, inside a community that needs to come into consideration. And I wanted to explain how people in these places are not only taking that into account, but making that a part of the philosophy uh, of how to coach, of how to live, of how to be, and how to be a part of an environment. And that was so important to me because increasingly in modern sport, I see that not happen. I see it being very isolated silos, purely performance, purely professional, um, and, a, and a distinct lack of consideration for the person or the context of the community or the club. And I think that's a worrying trend and something that obviously these people that I've been able to speak to and a host of more, many more, there are obviously many more people in this field, but even though it's still a minority, um, these people are trying to change. You know, they're out there trying to make a difference. And, and so del deliberately then, did you make a kind of choice to um, go and spend time with people who you saw as bucking the trend, so to speak? Yeah, definitely. There was definitely a, a consideration having put the question on the table does professional sport care about people i was very intrigued to find out if that was the case in professional sport and unfortunately i wasn't able to to explore as many other sports as i'd have liked i tried very hard to get into other fields and speak to other people in other sports but i found that if you work in one field and one sport for so long then people sort of consider you to be that and if you you know i haven't had the opportunity to build up connections in other sports over the years and that's just totally natural but um so it became mostly about football because it's the world that i know um but it also is ironically the world that needs the most help in this regard so <laughs> it wasn't necessarily a bad thing but i i definitely had it in my mind first are there people and if there are who are they and what are they doing and how does it actually look tangibly? Because I think often in this space of looking after the person, personal development, human development, um, well-being, mental health, often I think sometimes we fall into a rhetoric that is not accurate. And it's sort of easy to say, well, just have a workshop or just, you know, take a couple of days and meditate and you'll be fine. You know, and I think there is value in those individual approaches but what i was trying to find was something deeper something connected to the philosophy of club that was widespread that was part of the fabric of their approach not just something that was plug in and play because i don't believe that to be an effective method in this regard and i think a lot of the perception around human development is around this sort of soft approach not part of the performance environment um it doesn't you know comply with the perception we have of high performance athletes who are always focused and always determined and I think that's wrong and I think as I say these people are doing their best to change that but um yeah it, it just felt like such a necessary conversation to have now uh particularly at this point in time after 
you've seen so many athletes in the last few years come forward and be more open, be more honest about their experiences. Um, not just competing, but living as an athlete in the world where the microscope is on you all the time. Um, yeah, it just felt like now was the right time to have that conversation. Well, yeah, there's, there's definitely, I mean, the question that you started with, I suppose, you know, this idea of does sport care about people? Yeah. There, there does seem at the moment on a lot of different levels to, to be quite a significant sort of cultural reappraisal going on. Mm. Um, and I think it, it's, it's, it's in society in general. I think it's about, you know, almost like, you know, d does our society care about people? <laughs> and this is partly, I think, linked to the fact that, you know, there's, we're seeing sort of a little bit of, of, of a rise of, or an increase in, um, I guess what you might describe as more kind of authoritarian sort of political stances that are mm. seem seeming to gain traction and popularity. However, what we're also then seeing is institutions or parts of kind of established institutions acting in ways deemed sort of inappropriate. And so that then creates this different cultural reappraisal. So if you then think like this is happening in lots of different dimensions. So for example, equality and diversity is obviously, Definitely. you know, an yeah. extremely important part, particularly for, the, the generation that's coming through that you know like my, my son who you know he, my son who you know talks about his trans friend hazel like and it's just like it's it's an absolute nothing it's just a very normal part of his world whereas of course in when i was growing up that was quite different you know mm. so of course it wasn't something that you had the love so these are people who have a, a natural affinity towards equality and natural affinity towards people's lives etc cetera, etc cetera. we're seeing the same with you know um with with racism and you know a, a continuous sort of ongoing uh battle against racism and racial inequality in sports and then of course we're then seeing this in in what you might call uh, just general well-being where there is this approach this sort of consideration now that um, and, you know, we're seeing it in a number of different sports with various different sort of exposés around various either historical or or current abuses. And then lots of athletes coming out almost in a kind of me too style saying, yeah. you know, yeah, I, I also experienced this. And these athletes essentially saying we're just not prepared to put up with it anymore. Yeah. You know, this idea that we have to sacrifice our humanity in the pursuit of something that's no longer going to cut it. Now, it's a really interesting dimension, isn't it? Because there are so many forces at play that, yeah. that work against that. And, you know, and, 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 and you definitely touch on this without necessarily browbeating us. But it's very interesting, <laughs> you know, kind of how that sort of theme emerges as you as you go through the journey. Yeah, I mean, there are many layers of complexity to it. And, you know, I never wanted to create something that was beating people around the head with saying, like, you need to know this or, you know, <laughs> this is something that, you know, needs to be addressed. Uh, I, I wanted to create something that was clear about the changes that need to be made. Absolutely. And I hope that that's that's how it's come across. But, yeah, I mean, I think it gets more complex when you start to expand beyond the borders of sport. But it would be foolish not to because people are not just who they are in an arena. So I think considering that more going forward is something that sport's gonna to have to do. Athletes have clearly, as you have said, I think in the last few years, taken a greater stand and said, look, we're not going to suffer under these situations anymore. I think it sort of expands closer to, or extends to the idea of a victory being the, the ultimate prize. Um, and whatever that represents, you know, success in whatever form. But what I have found is that success in sports is effectively never ending. And so you generate an environment in which people are never satisfied. So one of my favorite examples is, is often you see this. Uh, there was a clip, I think, uh, a few uh, years ago. Or was it last year? Yeah. But, so the Bayern Munich documentary that's on Amazon I think after they won the Club World Cup, there's a small clip of uh, Joshua Kimmich and Leroy Sane talking. And they're not celebrating the victory. They're talking about how they could be better next time. <laughs> now, this was, I think, a lot of the on online response to this was, wow, look at this level of determination and ability to just constantly look to improve. And there's obviously validity in that. But I think there's also an element that wasn't as discussed that made me think, wow, still not happy. 
they've just won something. We can have another conversation about whether the Club World Cup is worth celebrating or not. But that's by the by. It's a trophy. You play to win trophies. They've won a trophy. And it just looked like they, they weren't enjoying it. And so you have to have then maybe a consideration of the bigger part of sport. If, if winning is what we're sort of drilling into young people in the sport from whatever age, you know, you've got to win, you've got to be competitive, you've got to have the edge, whatever you need to do, just make sure you win. What does that do when they get to the stage where they are winning regularly and it's still not enough? Now, I'm not saying don't create people who want to better themselves. Absolutely. You know, there's, there's something to be said about that. And I, I think we all want to improve on who we are as individuals, let alone what we do in the professional space. But I think there's an intense level of danger that comes with never being satisfied or never having a moment to appreciate what you achieve. And you hear it from coaches very often. You know, I never had the, the chance to experience the joy of a promotion because I was too busy doing the job or I never had the chance to really understand what it meant to win something. And I think we have to have a serious conversation about what that means in sport. If winning is not enough, which is effectively what we are saying sport is about, because there is always a winner and a loser, right? Effectively, um, that's the nature of competition. Then we have to start talking about what sport is beyond that. And that's where I think if you, if you are as a club or an organization or an association, considering the human being, then you are going to win on way more levels and way more sustainable long-term levels than if you were just trying to win every Saturday or win every competition that you're in every year. Because what you're doing, whether the people in your environment are on the pitch or play for you or not, or they're your backroom staff, or they work in the hospitality area in the stadium, they all have an understanding and a feeling, most importantly, that they are part of something bigger than a win on a Saturday, right? And that, that is something that is so, so important. You have to create an environment in which people feel like they are happy where they are. They have the opportunity to develop, absolutely. But also that they are winning on a Saturday anyway, right? Like, I, and this is where it gets complicated because I'm sure some people in sport would say, yes, but if we lose, you know, we need to change things. We need to try and get back and managers are under pressure to win every Saturday. And if they don't win three Saturdays in a row, they're worried about losing their jobs. And that is a part of the issue. We can't have an environment where people are so worried about losing that they are only focused on winning and nothing else. That is a big part of the problem. But if you create a situation in an environment where people feel that they are furthered as a person, that they are considered as a human being, their well-being is looked after, their mental health is considered, their professional opportunities are in front of them and are clear, and they are a valued part of a team wherever they work in the environment. They are all part of that success. They are all part of moving forward. Then I think you're going to find people are willing to stick at it for longer, but also your success is better, your, your general success, because whether these... Whether people end up leaving after one year or two, whether people end up playing for your first team or not, whether they even stay in professional sport or not, if they're players or coaches, you guarantee, if you do these things, that people walk away and said, that's a brilliant organization. They cared about me. And you have a feeling that no one else can in these areas because a lot of people are just treated like customers or assets or, you know, next person, thank you very much. You give people the feeling that they were actually a part of something. And it's not just a feeling, it is actually what is happening. You know, if you leave this club, you are leaving a family because they made you feel like someone that was an integral part of that. And I think there is a way to do that. It's very complex, um, but it is something I think we need to do if we are to avoid a future of modern sport that is only ever about the pursuit of victory. Because for me, when as a fan even, just to someone on the outside, if I only support a team for winning, there's got to be more to it than that. I have to support a team for what they represent, who they are in the community, why I connect with them has to be beyond who the people are that I interact in that space with, has to be beyond winning games. Because sport, yes, you all want to see your team win at some point. And I think over the hundreds of years that sport has happened, at some point your team wins enough games and wins something that you get joy from that feeling of victory. And it feels great. We all know that. But it has to be about more than that. I I to I mean literally the like <laughs> light bulbs <laughs> are going off so many places I don't even know where to start. Um, something just, just something really interesting actually about that particular example you used of 
Kimmich and Sane talking about getting better and this notion of winning like you say I love this idea that you put there about you know winning on a Saturday anyway so it's it's a really interesting thing isn't it because the game outcome is currently the only metric or the predominant metric utilized exactly as to whether you've won or not and yet what if we were to look at a range of other metrics or sorry not metrics a range of other elements that we could equally define as winning now interestingly once again you know without wanting to sort of personalize this too much but my son's under 14 football team Mm. Now, this isn't the team that I coach because I coach him in field hockey, but he gets coached by a friend of mine uh, who is in who's doing under 14. Now, this is, you know, this is challenging time with 14 year old boys because they Definitely. and this is proper grassroots stuff. And the team he plays for, you know, um, he only started playing football about two or three years ago and he was able to go to this club because it was brilliantly inclusive. And it was it was actually set up because quite a few kids weren't getting any game time. And so actually this whole methodology was everybody gets to play, everybody gets game time. And they right. started when they were like nine and it was, and it's great. And he's been able since the age of about, you know, kind of like 10 or 11, even though his skills at the early stages were really quite limited because he'd just not really played the game very much, which is, you know, odd for a, a boy, but he generally hadn't. Um, and he's actually been able to develop into a decent ish footballer. Um, uh but but anyway, so within this environment, um, the coach, one of the reasons I took my son there was because the coach very much had that philosophy of there's there's other things than results. Now, it's good because they get hammered most weeks. Yeah. So, of course, you know, that creates that sort of situation. Yeah. Now, as they've got older and societal stuff, i.e. peers mm. have got involved and other players of in other, other either within their club, but at a different level mm. or other players around them, you know, begin to mock them slightly Mm -hmm. you know they've actually started to create almost a subculture which is interesting which is you know like like we're the worst team in the world sort of thing that they're kind of semi-proud of almost right which is interesting but of course some of them are also striving for something else now what's really interesting is following a kind of a particular game where there was a lot of player rotation um which is part of the philosophy of gate lots of people playing but it also meant that, and, and also the philosophy was, particularly when they were younger, that we play in lots of different positions, you get to experience different things. But of course, they're getting a bit older now. Mm. Size makes a big difference. Maturation makes a big difference. And so their ability to compete in certain positions is more difficult. And so they're beginning to say, well, look, we probably need to be more playing in, in some favoured positions now because it helps us to create some cohesion. So they kind of then approached <clears throat> the coach and said, look, we, we want to change it. We want to change our philosophy slightly now. And the reason they said it wasn't said, we're not, it's not because we want to win. Because we know that's out of our control. We just want to be able to compete. And at the moment, we're not able to compete because we're not making the best of the people that we've got. And they're really mixed ability. And so what's interesting is, is that young people, I think, have this intuitive sense of this, Mm. which is to recognize that actually... They just want to be able to do their best. Yeah. And so they're asking the coaches, look, you need to help us do our best by actually changing the philosophy slightly, which means some of us are going to get slightly less pitch time than others, albeit we're still going to get at least half a game. And we're going to be a bit more focused on rotating through certain positions, which helps us. We're going to maintain consistency. We're going to try and play players in their strongest positions wherever we can, given the limitations of so that was right really interesting and then the other bit that i thought was just really interesting and i will stop in a minute was how they from the outset have always had this idea and this has been the concept that they don't necessarily care so much about the outcome as long as they know that they've done they've they've been able to give their best and they've come off so dejected times and the reason they've come off dejected both coaching staff and players is they know they haven't done their best yeah. And it's almost like a, 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 a it's like a downward spiral that goes through a, a group that, you know, once it all starts to unravel. And part of that actually was the strangely enough, the everybody gets the equal playing time philosophy meant that even if you didn't try, you got equal game time, which mm. then meant the ones who were trying were like, why Hold do on. I bother? 
And so yeah. that spirals out of control as well. So we've so of that course. actually, so one of the values, if you like, or the principles now is we have to be a hunt, we have to be giving, we have to be earning our pitch time, not just for the pursuit of the outcome of the game, but for each other. Now they're starting to unpick some of these connective ideas and this, that, and the other. And it's actually interesting yeah. to watch them now rebond as a team, whereas previously they were fragmenting. Yeah, I mean, the fact that that's happened off their own back, though, is the most interesting part of that. You know, so often in these situations, you hear about coaches saying, this is the way we're going to do it. I will say this, and then you go from there, right? The fact that there's an environment in which the coach has said, right, we want everybody to have equal opportunity, that's great, but the players have then sensed that they're this, the best way to do this is to actually maybe adapt inside this environment. Yeah. And they've led the force for that change. That's really encouraging because it means that they've had to take the initiative and the coach is effectively just sort of nudging them or guiding them rather than dictating to them the, the parameters in which they can operate. If they have to find the solutions themselves, it's, it's a win-win for everybody, whether they become professional athletes or not, because you're forcing young people to have to take the initiative and figure it out for themselves. And that's only a good thing because you're not giving them everything. You're not giving them the answers. You're effectively giving them all the pieces and say, try and figure it out for yourself. And that, exactly. that's the bit that stands out for me as being the most exciting. Well, also, and the, the important point for me as well was um, that I think it's a very, very strong statement about the environment that the coach has created, that Definitely. actually they feel that they can have Absolutely. that conversation yeah. um, because a lot, and also for the coach to sort of, you know, go, all right, then I'm going to, I'm going to have a listen and I'm going to hear. And, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of ego sometimes involved yes. and you might push back and this, that, and the other. Interestingly enough, though, I remember I was giving a couple of them a lift home and, you know, um, and they were talking about this game that they lost. And they were so dejected and everything else. And they were so, oh, I think I'm going to leave and this, that, and the other. And I remember saying to both of them, well, why would you do that? Why would you just leave? You could have the same problem somewhere else. I said, you've got an opportunity to change it. Why not show some leadership? I said, one thing about your coach is I know he will listen to you, right? So go and ask and go. And they did bless them. And, and you know, and it, and it was it, it kind of all things worked out. Anyway, sorry, I've taken you down my level. No, that's great. I like it. <laughs> I like it. But it, it, the reason I said it was it, you made me think of that. But interestingly, just going back to Sane and Kimmich, one thing I wondered was, do you think that's an example of almost like an extreme growth mindset? Because what they're saying is they actually value the struggle of improvement. That's where they find joy. They find joy in them continuously looking at ways in which they can become a more cohesive, connected unit to find flow, to find connection, to find uh, an, an improvement area. And actually, the outcomes are... Uh, if you like a one of the kind of yardsticks that would you you would use on your journey of self actualization mm. and interest so interestingly enough because I do think sometimes elite athletes are wired in a kind of interesting interesting way <laughs> yes. and you can't always interpret the way an elite athlete thinks and acts and then try and and try and apply that to the rest of the world Definitely. because particularly children who got, who've got very different needs but it's an interesting concept because I think that's the sort of thing that I think Carol Dweck would look to mm. and say yeah, there you go. There's people who are saying, actually, the outcome isn't the interesting thing. It's the process of getting there that they value and they're continuously interested in. Yeah, I mean, there's there's nothing wrong with that. And I certainly would be the last person to say, stop that. You know, I wouldn't, <laughs> you know, if you've got people in your team who are interested in that kind of continuous development with an outcome being something that is as a result of that, rather than just being their pure goal, yeah. then great, especially in such a high level competitive environment, then that's wonderful. My only consideration is from a human perspective, whatever it is that you do, if you're focused on improving, 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 I do think that there is an element of, of life at some point where you think, wow, I just wish I'd enjoyed it more. And I have heard it so many times from elite athletes or top level coaches after their careers, where they have realized and they've come out of this sort of bubble or the mindset of intense performance all the time and thought wow I could have just enjoyed it a bit more and I think ultimately th there probably needs to be a bit more of a balance you know I'm not saying stop being so competitive in this environment if you want to get better on the field that is a win for this team and I'm not going to stop you but I think if you can foster an environment in which individuals are capable of saying we just won something that's great let's celebrate it if it's for 10 minutes take it you know that's fine I'm not saying celebrate it for three weeks but I do, I do think that there has to be an element of enjoyment because ultimately, not to get too philosophical, philosophical, but what are we here for if we can't enjoy those successes? 
you know, like life, life is very much about the, the, the people that we meet, the interactions that we have and all of the adventures along the way. But I, I don't think that the moments that we find that intense joy in or that we have achieved something that of professional level that deserves a moment of recognition should just be overlooked. And obviously, if an individual doesn't want to do that, then you shouldn't force them. Absolutely not. But I think generating an environment in which something like that can be enjoyed is absolutely necessary. So that it's not just this ruthless pursuit of glory, because um, I don't think that's necessarily too healthy. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I'm with you. I guess I, where I'm coming from, I suppose, is I, 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 I'm sort of intrigued by this idea because you talk about Guardiola talks about this quite a bit. You mm. see him often like vehemently dealing with a, a journalist, you know, because they'll sort of say like they'll, they've lost. And of course, the journalist is like, you know, only too quick to sort of ask the pointed question, you know, and he's he vehemently defends the team sometimes, um, you know, and says, we played brilliantly. We played brilliantly. Right. Yeah. Uh, result didn't go our way, but we played brilliantly. I genuinely believe he absolutely 100% is committed to that ideal to the center of his being and he knows when he doesn't say it publicly he knows when his team's played poorly and won yeah and he derives no satisfaction from or very little satisfaction from that okay. or less satisfaction from that yeah. um and so i wonder whether sometimes you know when you intuitively know that you've played poorly and won and it's 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 an empty feeling I'm not sure what happened in this particular game, so I don't know the ins and outs of it, but yeah. um, there's an empty feeling when you know you haven't realised your full potential. What you actually want is, you know, and, you know, so what you, playing badly and winning, like one thing, um, playing well and losing, you don't necessarily want either. No, that's true. <laughs> what you I mean, want is to play really well and win. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he said recently, I think it was after the 5-0 in, in the Champions League, he said, oh, you know, the performance could have, could have been better the score mm. was perfect but the performance could have been better there you go and that's exactly it and i think as a coach you know that's that makes sense you know you're talking about one game you're assessing the situation and to say that just because you won five nil everything was perfect would be to drop the standards that he sets himself and the team sets themselves and that's why you know absolutely fantastic teams over the course of sports history continue to perform even after good performances because it would be easy to say we won 5 0, we're fantastic, there's nothing to improve on. And now I have no issue with that. that. That makes total sense to me that you would look to seek improvement in that. Um, he, the source of enjoyment is where I'm sort of interested. You know, are we taking time to consider is there a feeling of like, wow, we just won 5 0, that's great? Yes, okay, in the 70th minute, I had a couple of moments where I could have been better. I'll take that going forward. I think that becomes more of a concern for me when you start to win something beyond games. So when you start to win trophies trophies or you start to win something bigger you know that's mm. when you start to ask those questions but um yeah i mean it's it's such a fine line and uh i think guardiola obviously knows ex exactly how to to balance that to a certain degree i i just i always worry that if you have this constant pursuit of improvement and i don't wish that to this to be confused with sort of accepting or settling for who you are like i'm you know, yeah, obviously yeah. we're trying to get, we're trying to improve all the time and be better at whatever it is that we're doing as people, as much as in a professional space. But I just think that there is an element of danger in this specifically in professional sports, because you have a game every Saturday. So there is an opportunity every week to say, I can do better next time. I can do better next time. And one of the guys I spoke to in, in Seoul, Rick Cockreave, who used to play, uh lacrosse um for england he used to he said something so true to me and I, I re it's really stuck with me he said if you say to someone every week you've got to get better you've got to get better you've got to get better you are not far away from telling them every week that they're not good enough and i do think that there's something damaging about that because ultimately what is that like can you imagine yeah okay we want to get better and we want to improve but if you do something, you know, if you're lucky to play the sport for 10, 15 years and all you've heard in that time period is you're not good enough, you know, you've got a lot of life to live after that. <laughs> How do you come out of that not thinking that you're not good enough in, in everything that you do? And of course, that can generate a, an intense growth mindset that allows you to reach heights that other people cannot and, and all of those things. But I just think that there's an element there that we need to consider because you don't want to be telling someone that they're not good enough for 15 years. 
No, you're right. And it's important to stress this. I think it's a good point you make, actually. Um, it, and it, it, it's this idea, I think, and what you're starting to talk about almost is starting to become a bit more kind of philosophical and esoteric, yes. which is this idea of like, what, what brings happiness <laughs> to humans? You know, what, what brings us joy? Uh, I can hear Sam Jarman screaming at this, at this as, we, <laughs> as it goes out, you know. Um, but interestingly, and it's a question that I think people are asking themselves, you know, what, what is it in sport that brings happiness? I think there's, a, there's an, a more interesting dimension to this. And I think you allude to this. So it's interesting that in the book, in the main, you're focusing on development, what I would describe as developmental environments in general, right? You're talking about cultures within clubs, yep. what Martin Rothwell would describe as almost like a meso culture. Mm -hmm. So a club, which obviously you have a little bit more control of because of the nature of the humans as opposed to a nation or whatever. Yeah. So, um, um, uh, or it might be a macro culture, not a meso culture. Um, so it, within a club or environment, you know, there's a developmental environment. Now, what I think you're alluding to, which is interesting, is there is a natural assumption that what's good for the elite athlete should be translated down to the developing athlete. Mm. And I think we should question that. Mm. And, I, and I mean, what I mean, what, and I mean, what's good, I mean, like, you know, from a perspective of values, principles, ways of being, ways of perceiving the world, et cetera, et cetera. And that is something that we should should question at all levels of sport uh, in in all sports yeah i mean my, my that yeah that is that is a good point and my, my only question with that though is it is i think it's insightful that when you look at things like player care or mm -hmm. well-being that more often that kind of provision or that kind of environment is in academies and not in first teams because Ooh. in first teams there's this there's this sort of unspoken thing where it's like, well, you've made it now. So yeah. why would you need that? And my appeal would be, you need it more than ever in this environment because you are now under greater pressure. The expectations are higher than ever. You're earning more than you've ever earned. And are you telling me that we just expect human beings to, to handle that and to be able to deal with that? So at the elite level, if, you, if we're talking about that sort of being first team, Premier League, whatever, um, I can't think of a more necessary situation to look after the character and the personal development of someone. If you're a 22 year old who's suddenly playing first team football for Manchester United, then I think you absolutely need someone who's considering what that's doing to you as a person. Is that different from being a 17 year old? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. And you need to consider the differences there and there need to be different approaches. Yes. But that doesn't mean that there doesn't, there shouldn't be a, an overall philosophy that considers both aspects. And I think the, the perception that reaching the first team or reaching the, the highest level or being in a professional setting that isn't a developmental setting um, means that you have made it and therefore you're a complete human being is ridiculous because you, you may have had, if you have had the benefit of that kind of personal development along the way in those youth environments, and then suddenly you find yourself in this professional environment and you don't have it. You're going to be feeling a little bit more naked than you were before. But also it's such a telling decision by organizations or by clubs to say, oh, well, you've made the first team now, so you don't need that because now we're only ever about performance. And that just seems like the wrong message to send young people. You know, if you're, if you're in this environment, we need you to be understanding who you are and, and the bigger philosophical questions about your existence in this environment, but also in the context of your life more than ever here now, than just, you know, just than saying, oh, you were 17, you're in the youth academy. We care about you, whether you make it or not. Valid, important, should be done more often. Absolutely. Crystal Palace, great example. They've done that recently, looking at aftercare and professional football. I love that. But when you make a first team, why is it so rare that we consider the personal development of young people? Yeah, it just blows my mind. You know, 23, 24, 25 year olds need just as much guidance. Yeah, okay, look, you, me, we weren't in professional environments when we were 25, but we were still 25 year olds. You know, yes, there are different environments. And of course we were raised different ways, but there are so many similarities, so many similarities that we, it would be foolish to say, you know what, they're an, they're an elite athlete. So they've, they've gone through academies. They're different, they're wired differently. Yeah, sure there'll be differences. So they're also human beings and they do need very similar things that you and I need. And to not be able to look after that or help them answer those questions or generate environments in which we're protecting that part of them, trying to help them through it and not just leaving them out in the cold, as it were, to just be all about Saturdays. That seems wrong to me.
Yeah, it's it, it's interesting observation. Actually, I'd not thought about that. But it's also interesting to note that some of the <clears throat> most successful professional sporting franchises um, have that kind of provision baked in. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was fortunate to speak to Steve Johnson, who does a lot of work in Australia with rugby league, and um, they have done incredible work. I mean they are basically, in my opinion, at the forefront of this. They, they, and their advantage is that they're a smaller league, absolutely, yep. but they have, the, they have an independent governance, basically, over the well-being of their, their players and their coaches and their clubs. And they have two well-being officers at each team. I mean, it's amazing. You've got one ex-pro who's there to help players in transition before they transition so that they don't just arrive at the end of their careers and are completely confronted by what to do after sport. And they've got someone who's there specifically for mental health and well-being and considers the personal development of each individual. That goes for coaching staff as well. And the cool thing is those people tend to be a part of the coaching staff. They sit in on those decision-making meetings. So it's not like they're just someone that gets called up and says, oh, hi, Stuart, yeah, can you tell me, is Dave okay? Yes, no. Like, it's not about that. You know, obviously a sports psychologist is there for that. That's a different level. They're not there to make medical decisions. That's why you have sports psychologists and you have doctors, absolutely. But they are there for the well-being of their staff and the players. And they are there to help with career transitions, right? So if you embed that into your environment, then your entire process as a, as a, as a player, as a coach at an organization like that is so much healthier. It's so much more well-rounded because you come to the end and you're not fearing it as an end. You're fearing it as just another left turn or a right turn. It's just another road. It's not the end of the road. It's just another path. And you're prepared for it because you've been prepared for it all the way through. Throughout your career, you're not necessarily as confronted by X, Y, Z. In certain situations, you're you know, troubled by this or you're worried about addiction or you know, you're fe fearing how to handle ex you know, excessive amounts of pressure or you're away from your family and you don't know how to handle that. You have someone. There is someone there to help you with that. And you're not left alone. And I, I just think that's such a great example. Now, is rugby league in Australia clean? Absolutely not. They've had dreadful image problems over the last few years and they have had issues that they have had to contend with. Um, but I think their attempts to change that environment are very commendable. You know, they're not just sitting back and saying, well, you know, we've had some pretty bad, they've had very bad issues over the last few years and there's no shying away from that. But this situation where they've tried to create and embed people in organizations is such a, a positive step, I think. The question for me is, is it possible to do it in something as vast as the Premier League? You know, sadly, I would say no, because it's too big and it's too rich and it's too powerful. And you have to look at other ways to try and embed that kind of stuff, because I really think there's such a lot of value to it. Well, <clears throat> yeah, but strangely enough, <clears throat> I do think there's, um, there are kind of, all, there's almost like a count, counterculture mm. that we've been talking about. And you know, the book speaks to this really, which is, you know, I, I would say that uh, a number of, if you were trying to write this a number of years ago, I think it would have been harder to find the case studies, whereas yeah. now they seem to be more more prevalent because more organisations are asking these sort of different questions and trying to redress this cultural imbalance. And we will delve into this in a minute, but it just strikes me that there is a counterculture taking place and there is people beginning to ask a question. So one of the things that, um, that I think we'll see um, is more, more, more voices like yours, <laughs> uh, you know, kind of having having greater resonance and being amplified and all those sorts of things equally. Um, and I think that will apply to um, professional sports leagues because they recognize, you know, how easy it is to get an image problem and how impactful that would be. I mean, even if, even if you just put the, the pure and simple economics of it, yeah, you know, so um, that's a really interesting dimension to this. But the, the other thing for me that I was just thinking is interesting is that the other thing that will drive this change is the recognition that this is an important dimension of performance. So actually, absolutely. if you are only interested in the wins, absolutely, this is, this is another area that's massively neglected. We do a lot of work on physical health because being physically able to take the field is obviously very, very key. Yeah. 
but obviously, you know, what we don't have yet as good an understanding of is the mental dimension and yeah. mental health. Because if someone says, I'm not mentally ready to take the field, it's like, what's wrong with you? Yeah. You're deficient in some way. Yeah. And no. <laughs> Go on, sorry. Yeah, that's, that's a, big, a big problem. Um, mm. And I think it's changing. Part of the issue of that, though, is, of course, that there's not necessarily always tangible data for this. Yeah. Right? Because you can't say, I am 45% mentally ready to take to the field. I mean, there's a lot of good data, but it's so difficult to get like hard numbers in this field because it's such a, uh, I don't know how to express it, but it, it's such a, a, it's a field that doesn't necessarily lend itself to having representation through numbers, right? You can definitely do a lot of research and there are a lot of smart people doing a lot of smart things in this area, but it's not like you can just come out with one number that you take to the boardroom and say X, Y, Z, right? Like it doesn't work like that. So you require mm. someone who does have an understanding for it on a deeper level and you see it through the history of coaches and through players, but mostly through coaches who had a feeling for it. You know, Bobby Robson, one of my favorite managers of all time, had a feeling of how to speak to people and how to judge situations. But right? he really knew. And that's not, you know, is that something you can teach probably now more than you could years ago? But it's maybe not something that you can have in, you know, sets of data on that say, well, in this situation, he was 20% more empathetic. You know, like it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. But I think if you have an understanding of what does work, based on good research, then you can make smarter decisions. And absolutely, the key point here is the one you just made. It will bring better performances. It absolutely will. Because if you have people who feel better about themselves, more comfortable about who they are and their role in the universe, of course they will play better. Of course they'll perform better because they understand that the two are connected. You know, and I, I really think that. You can think about it on your own level as well. If you go to work, are you more likely to work and stay that extra hour to do that job if you care about the people that you work for and they, you know that they care about you? Absolutely you are. If you go to work for someone who just treats you like another number, employee number 37, you are not going to stay that extra hour and you cannot wait to leave at five o'clock. And there is a difference there. And it's the same for athletes. Yes, of course, as we said, there is always a difference. There's a different environment. There's a different expectation, the pressure, millions of people watching you. Yes. But if you play for someone and you are part of an organization that cares for you as a person, that cares for your family, that cares on a deeper level than that, you're going to want to stay that extra hour. You're going to want to do more of those things. And you're going to want to be a part of that team. You're going to want to sacrifice for the team. You're going to want to say, yeah, okay, maybe I don't play as much. Like we were saying earlier with the example of the lads who are under 14s. That might be a grassroots example, but it's still very applicable all the way up. Maybe I don't play so much here, but this is for the right, you know, the value of the team. You are contributing. And you're more willing to take that step mentally if you feel valued, understood, and appreciated. You make me think about um, there's a there's this there's a kind of role there that's like a very poor, not well understood or well well defined role because yeah. you, you've referred to it earlier as like well being people. I really yeah. like that concept, by the way. Mm. But there's there's something else there as well, which is I always think there's a really important role in any sporting organization if you have the means and professional sports do yes. uh, which is the interface between athlete and coaching staff mm. and I think of people like Gilbert and Noka in the All Blacks yes. I think of people um, uh, Paddy oh, I'm going to forget his name now which will come to me in a minute uh, who work within uh, the, um, the Proteas the South African cricket team when Gary Kirsten was there um, and very much working behind the scenes almost kind of provide you know b being almost like the coach whisperer a little bit and what they're yeah. doing is they're saying had an interesting conversation with such and such today um some things going on in his personal life there's some challenges within relationships i can see there's some uh there's some you know so we might need to think about the way we engage and all those sorts of things so like that's like the most critically valuable intel that you can ever have as a coach that you may not be able to spot. Why? Because there's a load of people that you've got to sort out. There's a load yeah. of inputs coming in, which yeah. means that your intuitive capabilities of understanding where individuals are. Yeah. It gets narrowed. Of course it does. Yeah, it does. And I think that's something we need to take into consideration that the coach is expected to do too much in the modern era. You need more people around them and yeah. Okay. There are a lot of people around coaches anyway. Um, but maybe one thing I've certainly found is in this field, the coach is the most important element, really. I think if we can reduce the number of people who are 
inputting to a certain extent to athletes and make it a lot more on the coach because the coach is ultimately the person that most players see as the go-to. They're the person, when we think of great managerial or coaching figures over the years, those are the people that everyone looks up to. You know, the two minutes before you go out, everyone's quiet. Everyone looks at the coach, right? There's, there's that aura, there's that, that understanding that they're the person. So I think if, if, if the coach can be the conduit for these kind of ideas, then it's almost even more beneficial. Like you were saying, you can have someone in an environment who's there to try and pick up on all that nuance and those things that the coach might not see because he's got 50,000 things to do. But it should be the coach who's transmitting and, and, and having those conversations because it, if you start, I think, if you start to put too many people into positions, then it can get more complicated because, you know, professional sport often gets hard when you have to convince people to remove their egos. And it's, very, it's a very natural thing for people to be in that environment and think, I could be that guy. I want to be the number one guy. Mm -hmm. But you really need a special group of people um, particularly in this role, who are willing to say, I don't want to be the number one. I do want to help this team. And I'm willing to do that in the background. Nobody needs to talk about me. I just want to help. And there are people out there like that, that you need people who are willing to make that difference and make it absolutely not about them. You know, that's the key. Um, but it's, it's not as common as you'd think because in these environments, people are very competitive. People work very hard to get to the top. And that's not to say, you know, relationships like physios with players, those are very important. You know, those should be fostered. They, those should be natural. Um, some players will always say that they have the closest relationships they have with the guys. If they get injured all the time, they tell these guys all these things that they would never tell anyone else. That's great. You know, you need those kind of things. I just think if you've got someone who's picking up and their job is to try and pick up on all this sensory information, they shouldn't always be the one that's going in and, and making all those, having all those conversations. Because I think the value of it coming through the coach is so much more powerful. Really, um, <clears throat> you're right. And, and I think this is where I've spoken about this recently. I think I made a point about this, which is the idea that the athlete gets all these different inputs mm. and you ask them to make sense of it. You're talking about a 19 year old, yeah. you know, uh, and then for them, you know, for them to just, you know, kind of be, be the, almost like the masters of their own destiny. So it's, it's quite challenging, whereas actually the coach is a sort of guide who can actually take some of those inputs, interpret them and then support the athlete to work out what it is that they need to you know embrace this that and the other so this is the idea of the multidisciplinary team absolutely um yeah it's a really interesting one and of course you know fundamentally as well coaches and head coaches who you know they have an enormous amount of power in terms of the future trajectory of somebody's career because they decide who takes the field who doesn't take the field who gets sold who gets bought who gets so there's an there's a there's a lot of an athlete will need from a coach to get them to understand and to feel like they've got something to con contribute. Uh, it made me think of something. I read a little an article really, again, these are all things that are out of context, right? But Klopp saying to one of his, one of his like new young players coming through from the Academy, I forget his name. It's about 19. And the first thing he said to him as he takes the field, I think it's in a champions league game, or maybe it was in a big night at, at Anfield mm. saying, Go out here and play. If you don't play well, that's on me. I choose to make, I chose to put you in the field right now. You go out and express yourself and enjoy what you enjoy what you do. So basically taking the responsibility of performance onto him to mm. say, I see something in you and I've chosen to put you in here because I believe in you. Yeah. You're the re whether you play well or not really is no, no, makes no difference. All I want you to do is to enjoy it. Interesting, different perspective, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And that's probably why he's so good at what he does, because he understands what needs to be said. I mean, yeah, the other example I can think of that relates to this, I think is Thomas Tuchel recently saying, now is not the time to laugh at Lukaku, right? Like now is not the time. Well, he knows exactly what he's doing by saying that. That has just put an enormous fire under Romelu Lukaku's feet to like inspire him to play better. So I think sometimes there's a there's definitely a case in Klopp here of taking the responsibility away, but it is also sort of like a reverse psychology. I'm giving you permission to excel here because I think it's Harvey Elliott. I think, I think Harvey been, Elliott. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. The young lad who came on. And it's like, if you hear that as a young player, it basically just gives you permission to do what you like. And it's so it takes everything away from you because again, even in that situation, he's a young person. It's extremely overwhelming. You're about to play Champions League football. How exciting playing for Liverpool, Anfield, wow, this is so much. How do you take all of that in? And if someone just says to you, in effect, it's just the past, 
go have fun you know like it's it's so it takes so much weight off your shoulders but in 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 a clever way and this is what makes you know clock in this regard so so special is that he's also just said to him you know show me what you've got yeah. because he's going to go out and play the best form of football that he can because he's not said to him, right, I need you to do this specifically. And maybe there's a player in a situation that requires that. And then he would say that. But again, this is what requires, this is why Klopp has such a great understanding of how to speak to people and how to interact with others. And that, that is linked to his childhood. You know, he grew up in a small town in Germany and, and that place was famous for hard work and people doing the job and he grew up with the sense of discipline and seeing things through um and he he has a deep understanding of that and that's allowed him to connect with other people because his his connection has originated in a very small community i mean he grew up in a place with like two thousand people so he has a very strong sense of community from his childhood that is translated all the way through his coaching and you match that with this appreciation for hard work and discipline it's no surprise that he is who he is. Yeah, it's, it's it's always interesting, isn't it? When you look at those backstories, it's one of the reasons I like backstories yeah. because it tells you something about an individual's makeup and how really they've does. arrived at where they are and the influences on them. Absolutely. Um, we've, we've talked a lot about the central messages of the book. Yes. Um, and uh, and by the way, when you before we came on, you mentioned about how your, your publisher's already talking about the third. So that's <laughs> yeah. interesting. But perhaps one of the things that the third might be might be the other sports context, which um, I'd be only too happy to uh, try and knock some doors down if, you, if you're uh, if you're of interest. Thank you. Yeah, that would much appreciate. <laughs> um, one thing I was going to say um, is obviously where one of the places I went to first and foremost, I was drawn to Sweden. Mm. And I saw AIK, mm. friends of the show. Yeah. Um, and one thing I wanted to say was, what you wrote uh, exactly mirrors my perspectives on AIK. Wow. From, cool. you know, having been there, yeah. spent some time with the people there, yeah. and spent a lot of time talking to the people there on this show. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and I'd just be interested in, I think you all, but you also, I think you you kind of, there was a few threads that you picked at that were different from some of the things that I've not been able to experience. And I'd be just interested just to sort of get some of your reflections on that because I would, I would, I would probably get roundly castigated by many quarters if I didn't at least delve into AIK with you for a bit. Yeah, I mean, they're such a special group of people. You know, Marcus mm -hmm. Sullivan, James Vaughan, Dennis Horton, such great people trying to do such great work. And I think what they deserve a lot of credit for is that they've tried to take an academic perspective to football, but not make it too academic so that people don't understand. And yes, their academic work has led to great research and that's really important but I think when they go out on the field or they speak to other coaches they're not speaking necessarily always in academic terms you know they're using that knowledge to inform them but they're able to still have the conversations that people really can appreciate and can level with can, can understand I think seeing them at work was really it was really great to to see how they try and approach things you know they're very focused on on the values of an environment they're very careful about creating you know a certain type of constraints do we not const do we not constrain you know how do we approach things i love the fact that they basically just try and give children so much autonomy over their own futures and i think that's such a powerful thing to do because for so long i think so many people have tried to control young people and really one of the smartest things that you can do is in effect let them be free inside a certain environment and um they've done that superbly and really they've not tried to simplify um and you know that's one of the other common issues i think is that even if coaching the most effective methods of coaching are simple i think um people will always be complex so you have to take that into consideration and to try and simplify or make something complex simple is is not really going to work and um i don't think they've ever tried to do that they've never tried to shy away from how difficult it is and Really, you know, James Vaughan has done so much work in this area, but I really, I think it's so important. He is so big on the impact of culture and the context of, of an environment on, a, on an individual. And so that you've got a group of people that are considering all of those things 
I mean, it's just amazing, you know, kids having to having the opportunity to decide I want to play with my friends for as long as possible. You know, I want to make a decision about how often I train. You know, I get to make that call. Do I want to train five times a week. Okay. Do I want to train twice a week? Sure. I want to play other sports. Great. You know, and then it only gets to be a slightly more of a like, okay, well, what do you really want to do when you get to like 15, 14, 15, 16, you have a sit down with them like, okay, do you want to maybe do more of this or that? And again, it's, it's always about their own decision-making and you develop an environment in which kids have to make their own choices and they're learning through trying to formulate their own um, understanding of the challenges that are put in front of them. It's again, it's not about giving them answers. It's about giving them all of the objects to find answers. Um, and I, I was just so impressed with that because it requires a very different approach to coaching. It's very easy to rock up to a session and I'm not saying this is wrong, but to say, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. These are the drills. I know the dreaded D word, but you know, these, these are the approaches and that's it. Right. And again, this is not to say that coaches who do that are doing anything wrong. Often we're working in environments where you're like, oh, this is the only way I can teach these kids or I'm working 10,000 miles away from my usual environment. Absolutely. But to see it here where it's the total antithesis of that was really amazing because I really think that there's so much more at play when you do that and you are developing the human, ironically, without necessarily putting too much language around it. We're just talking about well-being and having someone around that. What they're doing here is doing that without saying it because you're asking children to make decisions all the time on their own. Um, and that was, just, uh, that was just fantastic to see those values put into practice, to see people considering language when they interact with one another, how they treat their environment. Just great. Just great. It's a really interesting, um, it's a really interesting uh, story, I think. Um, and there's so much to it, like the amount of, well, firstly, the fact that, you know, the, the board of AIK, you know, mm. the board level, you know, made the commitment to this. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the, the need for, you know, this not just to be kind of, you know, this, if this was something that was kind of just generated by coaches within their sort of methodological space, then, you know, eventually you're going to find that it wouldn't be very long before, you know, the kind of the, the winds of uh, performances, for example, would yeah, maybe right. change or uh, the, uh, someone at the top of the, you know, the, the, the director of the academy changes and therefore the philosophy changes and you're at the mercy of the leader as, as you know, and so you're constantly almost reinventing yourself. Why? Because a new leader comes in and says, this is what we're doing. So you know, what AIK have said, no, is this is like a philosophical decision that we're making about Absolutely. the ways in which we're going to treat human beings within our developmental environments. Yeah. So that's the first stage. The second stage then is the external stakeholder engagement and the continuous selling the why. You've got something that is so, like you say, it's the antithesis. It's so yeah. much the opposite of what's normal. And you, you made me think of something. So in one of the, the later chapters in progress, you talk about um, when you talk, I think it's Chris Ramsey and a quote yeah. from him about the early professionalization. Yeah. You, just a quote here is Ramsey does his best to retain this organic play, but inside a professional environment, it's almost impossible, partly yeah. because of the environment, but also because of the aforementioned parental expectation. Professionalism is what they sign up for. And so the idea of saying to the kids, here are the bibs, here are the balls, go and play, isn't exactly what parents expect from professional clubs. But that's, that applies to grassroots. The reason we're seeing prem premature professionalism in the grassroots space is because parents are coming with a checkbook, not even a checkbook, or, but you know they're coming together with cash, they're paying for something and they expect it to look like something. Yeah. What AIK have had to say is, we're the opposite of that. And yeah. there's a reason why we're the opposite of that. These are the reasons. This is the theoretical underpinning and the philosophical underpinning about the way we believe young people um, could interact with a sporting environment. They use the word interaction a lot. Mm. Um, you can choose whether, th whether they're here or not, you know, in lots of ways, but we're just doing our level best to create that kind of an environment. But it's, it's, it's been a continuous educative process that they've had to be absolutely relentless with. Yeah. And to understand that, because those stakeholders are really critical. You know, they're actively making choices on behalf of young people about where they spend their time. Yeah. Sorry, on behalf of and with young people about where they spend their time. Really interesting. Yeah, and, and the best part of that is that they are effectively creating performance-related um, outcomes as well, because, and, and they put it so beautifully when I was there, is academy's purpose is what? 
to generate play for, players for the first team. That's what people always say. Mm. But they don't do that. They generate, you know, smart, strong, intelligent young people who may or may not become professional athletes. And the byproduct of that environment is players for the first team. It's not the purpose of the academy. And that, I think, is such a great way to approach it. So, yeah, you can have an academy. And if you're saying, well, we're only here so that we can make players transition to the first team, then your ruthless pursuit of that is to say, you know, Mark always has this great expression. Um, if you put eggs into a plastic bag and one of them is hardballed and you throw them against the wall and you take the hardballed one out, you say, look, it works. Yeah, think about all of the players that don't make it, but we only ever talk about the two or three that do because they make it to the first team. We're like, everything works because there's two or three players that have made it to the first team. Never mind the fact that probably like a thousand, five thousand players never made it in the same time frame. So if you change your approach and say, our academy is here to give young people the best possible start in life, wherever they end up. And the byproduct of that is that there will also be players for the first team. Amazing. Rather than just saying our sole purpose is to develop players for the first team. Because if you do that, then everything else becomes like, okay, you're not good enough. You're not good enough. You're, you're gone. You're gone. You're good enough. Blah, blah, blah. That's all you have a focus on. And if, it, if you change the formula, as it were, um, then you end up with so much more reward. And, and, and the, the absolute beauty of that is, and this is why I describe it as kind of like the ultimate in win-win propositions, yeah. is um, young people who are part of that environment get so much more from that environment than whatever the outcome may be. And given Absolutely. that, given that the numbers, and you make reference to the min minuscule percentages of <laughs> people who do transition, it's incumbent upon us to ensure that they have the best experience they possibly can so that they can then take their experiences, apply them in a different context if they want to, yeah. or apply them in the rest of their kind of life experiences. You hope that they're going to build connections that will be lifelong. This is what we try and do in the grassroots space. The ironic thing is, is that we're, <clears throat> we're moving away from that. So mm. it's, it's fascinating how some of these cultural dimensions they're really interesting i mean i, I love the fact that you, you you chose the title soul <laughs> because fundamentally that's the question you're posing isn't it what is the soul of sport <clears throat> almost it's a yeah, battle I mean, for the soul of sport isn't it it is yeah and i it was funny because i obviously you know i i think that's what we're really asking i think we're asking that question but we ask that ourselves uh, that we ask that question of ourselves almost all the time i think i know i do um What's, what is at the heart of what I do? Who am I? You know, these are big philosophical questions to a certain degree, but I think they also drive large parts of our existence and why we make the decisions that we make. So, you know, if sport is, you know, what is it, if we were to look at sport specifically, what is it that it really represents if we got it down to the absolute core of it? You know, and that's sometimes been disheartening to hear the truth of from people in the field because I don't think it represents something I want it to. I'm sure a lot of people feel the same way. I mean, we were just talking there about grassroots examples of perception versus reality. I give you money, therefore I expect to see X, Y, Z. I think that's unfortunately now being mirrored in a lot of school environments. Mm -hmm. I pay for something, I expect to see this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. You know, I expect you to raise my children. Well, hold on. I think we're getting confused here about what this kind of environment is, right? And I think that is only ever mirrored slightly in many other environments. You know, I pay for something and therefore I expect to see all of the things that come with that. Whereas the truth, uh, you know, what is the truth? But I, based on what I've experienced and the people I've spoken to, I consider the truth in this sense to be, it's never about something that's transactional. It's always about generating a situation in which you can find out the answers for yourself. Um, and, you know, we talked about at the beginning of the show, that so often means that it's not linear. And that kind of transaction implies a linear approach. You know, I give you X, you give me Y. You know, there's a direct move there. And actually, in truth, it's more like you give me the opportunity to A, and we might meet each other at G. <laughs> You know, like that's how it goes. And I, I really think that if we start to consider that more and not have this very clear 
sense of what's right and wrong or what the expectations are around people in professional environments, um, then it can maybe lead us to greater answers in this space, but also just a perhaps a more enjoyable situation for us all, you know? Uh, I am, I am, I would say determined. I'd love to be able to find the, not to find, but to create a situation in which people who have the opportunity to make this change do make changes off the basis of this work from, from other people in the, and they can see it. They can see that it makes a difference. I would love to see that happen. And um, certainly something I hope to see, but you know, you, you have to have a difference. You have to have people in the environment who consider it to be important. And I think the only way that you can do that and to convince individuals that that's the case is that it will increase performance. I think you can go in and say, morally, this is the right thing to do. You need to care about people, but I'm not sure that that's enough of an argument, um, as sad as it is to say. But if you can convince people that on a performance level, this is also gonna make a difference, then I think you'll see people signing up and saying, okay, if you can guarantee me a one or 2% performance increase because of this approach, then, then we need to have another conversation off the back of this one. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that, but you know, that's, I think that's the nature of the environment. You know, people love to talk about high performance. Uh, I love to talk about humans. <laughs> and I think it, it's, cap it's possible to do both. But I think too often we love to fantasize this idea of high performance and the commitment and all, all that goes with it. I talk about it a bit in the book. And I love to talk about it all the time. The Last Dance documentary with Michael Jordan. First of all, it's not a documentary because Michael Jordan signed off on it. So it's really a show. Um, secondly, that quote about winning and being uncomfortable. It doesn't have to be that way. I am absolutely convinced. Um, the greatest basketball player of all time changed everything, changed sport, changed sports marketing, incredible per, like player, did everything in that field. But I do not believe that you have to be that way to be the best. And I think it was insightful that all of the teammates said, incredible teammate, difficult person. And I do think it's possible to have an incredible teammate and a great person. And I think that's something that teams need to do more towards generating because that kind of legacy is something that goes beyond how many games you win. Think about your favorite players of all time. As I've gotten older, start to reflect on that. Was growing up when I was watching sport. Loved Alan Shearer just for the way he scored goals. Loved Johnny Wilkinson. Absolutely. When I get older, I start to appreciate Johnny Wilkinson on so many more levels than his ability to drop goal. And um, I think that, yeah, maybe that's just me, but I think deep down, a lot of people feel the same way. You know, when they watch athletes, when they watch teams, they want to care about people beyond what they do on the field. Brilliant. It makes me think um, that, you know, one of the taglines for the book, I mean, beyond the athletes, obviously fantastic, but there's another part of me, which is, you know, you're, shining a light on you know if there is a culture war because obviously we talk a lot about culture wars if there's a culture war in sport yes. then you're shining a light on some very brave and intrepid culture warriors you know or counterculture you know yeah. creating this counterculture so in many ways it's about sort of giving voice and and giving more um i guess more visibility to some of these people who are very are often very humble quite quiet one of the things i do love about the iak boys by the way is they're sharing the research continuously because they're actually evaluating and learning as they go which is obviously central to the process Definitely. listen jonathan i'm sorry i've got to uh, dip off because the world of work is calling into me um Not at all. And, uh, and i imagine that you've got stuff to do as well but it's been absolutely fantastic to catch up with you again um i'm Not i'm really in, i'm really enjoying the book like i say i'm working through it in a non-linear fashion um <laughs> And uh, yeah, you know, it's like I said, it's one of those things that stops me from going to sleep at the right time. So I wake up slightly tired. So that's your fault. But there we go. That's good. <laughs> um, what's uh, what's the best way for if people are interested in maybe speaking to you individually, getting you to come and speak at conferences or anything like that? I don't know. Um, now that we're unlocking or what's the best way for them to get in touch? I mean, I'm on Twitter quite actively, John Blog 66 so you can get in touch with me there. I'm on LinkedIn as well. Feel free. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for having me on. It's always a pleasure to talk. And I've said this before, but it rings true even 
two years after the first time, I have such a lot of appreciation for the work you do in this field and the people that you interview. So to be one of the guests is always very humbling. So I'm very grateful. Well, um, it's been brilliant. Like I say, it's been brilliant to catch up, and and I'm looking forward to the third episode or the third, <laughs> the third, the third book. Yeah, you heard it here. Um, listen, been great to see you, and uh, look forward to uh, look forward to reading and following and and catching up with you again as and when some other project emerges. Thanks, Stuart. Thank you very much.